Great. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Welcome to the webinar on women academic entrepreneurs. I'm Kirsten Loita of o OUP, which is Osage University Partners. We call ourselves OUP for short, um, and I'll be your moderator today. We hope everyone's doing really well in this very difficult time and appreciate you joining us. I imagine a lot of the webinars and other things um, that you've been attending online have had to do with COVID-19. We have a different subject for you today, um, one that obviously we're all very passionate about. We're here um, and we're delighted to talk with you about it. So our discussion today will center around the state of female academic entrepreneurship across the university startup ecosystem with the goal of providing insight uh, and practices universities to ad can adopt to foster more successful female entrepreneurship. Let's start off by getting to know our panelists. Um, I'll have each of them provide a brief introduction to themselves. I already introduced myself uh, as Kirsten Loita of OUP. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie Stamen here. Uh, I'm a principal on the life science investment team at, at OUP. I've been there for four years now, uh, and I am a, a cell biologist by training. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Nicole. Thank you, Kirsten. My name is Nicole Mercier. I lead tech transfer at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I'm also a cell biologist by training. Great. Thank you. Casey. Hi, I'm Casey Mara. I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, a polymer chemist by training, and I'm also founder and CEO of Axomax Technologies. Terrific. Shoba. Hi there. Um, I'm Vice President for External Innovation and New Ventures at Sontageny, uh, a biotech accelerator based in Boston. And uh, well, my background is I uh, started out as a research scientist in molecular biology turned a businesswoman now. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us today and uh, thanks in advance for sharing your experiences. So Stephanie, um, I'll have you take it away. Great, thanks Kirsten. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to be participating today and, and talking about a topic that is very important to me. Um, some of you may remember uh, a few years back, I wrote a blog post where we analyzed activities of academic entrepreneurship and how they broke down by gender. So to kick things off today, we wanted to revisit that analysis and show some of the updated numbers. Uh, so the, the first thing to start off with is looking at the academic career path by gender. Um, and so you can see uh, overall, uh, if you look at on the, the graph along the bottom, there are blue squares. Um, and so these show, if you were to look at gender, how um, the percentage of women holding those positions across all disciplines, uh, you can see actually for some of the lower ranking uh, positions, assistant professor, or associate professor, um, women are actually have achieved or are very close to achieving parity. Um, there's still a little bit of a discrepancy at the level of professor, where across all disciplines, uh, only 34% of those positions are held by women. Uh, the story is a little bit different when you look specifically at those numbers for STEM positions. Uh, and so that information is what's shown by the bars here. And you can see uh, for an assistant professor, about 40%. Uh, of those roles are held by women, about 35% associate professor, uh, and then uh, below 20% um, at the professorship role. So now I think this overall, uh, the data show that there has been a really fantastic amount of progress, um, and we've made really great strides, but that we still do have uh, a long way to go in, in achieving parity uh, across the, the academic career spectrum. Um, so, turning to the next slide, uh, so we'll talk a little bit now about academic entrepreneurship, and I know with this audience, I, I don't think it will be any surprise to say that uh, the number of startups that have been formed based on university research has been steadily on the rise. Uh, and so, we wanted to ask ourselves, um, how, how does uh, how do the activities of academic entrepreneurship break down by gender? Uh, we decided to do this by looking at two specific activities. So the, the first is patenting, uh, and then uh, in later slides, we'll talk a little bit about company formation. Uh, so moving to the, the next slide, we'll take a look at, at patenting. 
Um, so there was a really great study that was done uh, that looked at all patents issued by the USPTO dating back uh, from 1976 all the way through to, to 2013. Uh, and the numbers show uh, an actually a, a very uh, impressive uh, increase in the number of women authors on patents that were issued. Uh, when you look across all settings, uh, there was an increase from 2.7% to 10.8%. The numbers actually look even better when you specifically look at the university setting. So there, the numbers increased from 2.5% to 18%. Uh, and so at first glance, you know, this, this looks like really tremendous progress, and, and it is. Um, but the problem is that in a second study, uh, they ran an analysis and they projected the date at which the US would achieve gender parity in patenting. And it's 2092. So um, I know that I will not be alive to see that day. I imagine most of you listening right now to this webinar will also probably not see that day. Um, and so, I think what it kind of it highlights here that we can't just assume that gender parity and academic entrepreneurship is just naturally going to resolve as we see an increase in the number of female faculty appointments. It's, it's something where we're going to have to be more proactive to really encourage uh, the activity of, of women um, in, in um, academic entrepreneurship. Um, so then uh, going to the last slide. We'll take a look at company formation. So most of you know that OUP keeps a really fantastic database. It now is comprised of over 11,000 startups. And this information comes from our more than 100 university partners that are uh, across the world. And so to, for this analysis, um, what I did was uh, took all of the information for all of those companies that have been formed. And for many of them, we have a field where we track the scientific founder and a scientific co-founder. Um, and I could use a gender matching software to determine what percentage of those companies had a female founder. Um, so of the, the software that we use is imperfect. There's obviously a certain margin of, of error here, but of the 11,500 companies in our database, just over 7,500 of them, uh, the gender of the scientific founder or co-founder could be determined. Um, and from that, we saw that 13% had a female founder. Um, this is actually, you know, I looked back at my my data from three years ago from the blog post, that number was 11%. Um, so it is improving slightly, uh, although perhaps probably still within the margin of error for the way this analysis was done. Um, but then looking at the, the bottom slide, so this shows um, the uh, breakdown between uh, scientific founders of men versus women uh, and the number of companies formed. So the first thing that you'll note if you look at the companies formed, and so that's the, the columns on this graph, you'll see that it doesn't perfectly track to what we saw earlier on the autumn slide. Now, that's in part because the, this is data coming from the OUP database. Uh, which means it's only including companies from the universities that we are partnered with. And it's also only including companies where the gender could be determined. And so that's not all companies. So the, the data set is a little bit different um, than, than what we saw previously. Um, but what you'll see is that uh, the breakdown of, of company formation for men versus women uh, holds rather steady. It's roughly 87% of companies are formed by men. Uh, and about 13% uh, are, have, are formed by women. Um, and that even as the number of companies formed over time has changed, that number has remained relatively steady. Um, so we're seeing, you know, as we saw with patenting, we are also seeing here with company formation that there is a, a very big uh, discrepancy in, in company formation by gender. Um, so there's a lot of potential explanations uh, for why that is. And it's actually, I think, a, a perfect segue into our final discussion. So with that, I will turn it back over to Kirsten. Thanks. Uh, Stephanie, we do have a couple of questions uh, from our attendees. Oh, wonderful, yeah. So yeah, so one of them is, um, what criteria do you use to determine women engage in engagement in patenting? Um, do you look at the role a woman may play in the terms of inventorship 
uh, versus being part of a team that may be, may be comprised of male inventors? Yeah, so for the slide on patenting, both of those were published studies. That's, that's where the data came from. And I believe the criteria there was whether or not a woman was listed as an author on that patent. Right. I think that, that, would, that would be the scope. Yeah. It is inventorship that is yeah. looked at yeah. there. And then another person asked actually about the study because they said 2013 is quite a long time ago now. Have there mm -hmm. been no updated studies or? Um, yeah. and, and well, unfortunately, I I, she knows a lot of people at the USPTO. Yeah. But, um. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see an updated analysis because I would really hope that those numbers have improved, but I have not been able to find one. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and actually, that segues nice way into Nicole. Uh, she she may know if there are more, some some more recent numbers that we haven't been able to find. But Nicole, we're going to transfer over to you now to talk about some of the work that you've been doing at uh, Washington University, and of course on Equalize 2020. Thank you. Um, so these are so the questions that came up um, in Stephanie's. I did want to point out that there is additional data that. Um, the Autumn Survey now collects about women inventors, and so there is some data out there, though I don't know if it's in the public domain yet, but we are working on trying to put something in the public domain so that people can, can see. But it does not track lead inventor versus sole inventor versus how many um, you know, male inventors might be on that. But, but there are groups working on it, and I know the USPTO is working as well. Great. Um, so if we I wanted to talk today to you about, um, so very briefly about how we came about Equalize and, and it sort of starts back with our experience at Washington University. We started thinking about supporting women innovators in 2013. Our university was at a unique time and we were, we wanted to, we, we, we had a new uh, vision for innovation and entrepreneurship at our university and we were concerned that when we launched that new vision, we had been really reading a lot about the disparities between how men and women engage in commercialization. And we thought, can we do something so that our women don't fall further behind as we launch this effort? So we started programming in 2013 and we really made this focus around um, a couple of things that we had been reading in the literature that caused these disparities or led to these disparities and that we felt that we could control. So there's some that we feel is best controlled maybe by the female herself, but these ones we felt that we could. That was the language around commercialization. We're good at educating as a tech transfer office. Um, and how do we think about driving robust networks and sharing the networks that we have within the tech transfer office um, more uh, definitively and more purposefully? And so that was really what we did, uh, I guess that's seven years ago now. And a lot of what we learned was still documented in the literature. Um, but it was, it was still interesting to sort of see that play out. We understand that women wear different hats or wear their hats differently than men. That sometimes they don't necessarily, you know, put on the inventor hat, the entrepreneur hat, and the researcher hat all at the same time. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, there's a lot of things that women deal with both within the university and outside the university um, that are not the same things are in the same way that men have to deal with them. Um, and we knew that women need to be invited to participate, um, but we really have, uh, that has become more evident to us as we've programmed over these seven years. Um, even women that have been in our program, we still continue to go back to and talk to and make sure that they feel part of this network and try to understand what's next for them and how can we help with that. Um, the other realization to us were, you know, we have connected individuals through our networks into the St. Louis ecosystem and outside the St. Louis ecosystem. Um, but it's still, we still find that we need to help visualize that path. And so sort of getting back to the previous bullet on the invitation to participate, um, helping connect some of those because of all of the other things that women have to um, have on their plates it helps to have somebody sort of continue to walk you through that and be your partner in that effort. Um, and more than ever, we realized that networks and role models are absolutely critical to this. When we started our own program at Washington University, we had not a single female who had founded a company. 
we now have four, uh, four women who have started companies and um, our rate of company formation with female founders is much less than what OUP provided. We're at about 4% of our companies um, having female innovators, but we're hoping to, or female founders, we're hoping to grow that. Um, what really launched Equalize though was um, a, a lot of what we had learned, but then in 2018, we were asked by the Association of American Medical Colleges to apply for their award um, for innovations and in research education. And what we found when we went to talk to some of the participants that had gone through our program was sort of getting back to that very first bullet about how women wear their hats. One said to me, you know, what our, in our programs called WIT, um, what WIT did for me was to help me understand when I came into WashU, I was a researcher and I am an inventor. And I thought at that moment, well, we've only made it 50% of the way, but if, if I had exposed her male counterpart to all of the things that we did through WIT programming, he probably thought he had a deal on the table and he had funding coming in and you know that person that he met uh, was his partner for life. And it was just very eye-opening for me um, in that moment to read that quote that I got back and I said, well, we need to do something bigger um, and that Washington University couldn't do it alone. And we were fortunate to find OUP as a partner to help us do that. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so in lots of conversations with Kirsten and Stephanie, we launched um, OUP, uh, we, we launched Equalize. And as Kirsten said, it really was supposed to be um, a wonderful coming together with symposium to think about some of the barriers, but not just think about those barriers, but how do we take action on those barriers and, and grow as a nation around this? Um, and also to put a pitch competition together. So some of this was modeled after our annual symposium that we hold every year at Washington University and after OUP's Science to Startups pitch competition. So we sort of merged these two things. Um, and we didn't know if this would be successful. We didn't know if anybody would even want to do this. And we thought, well, it's going to be in St. Louis. Would anybody even want to come? Um, and, and we hoped all of that would be a yes. And so when we launched in, um, when we launched this in November to try to ask for applicants, um, we were so pleased to have 57 applications. And you can look at the map on the right hand side of where we got applicants from, representative of 36 schools in over 20 states. Um, but you can see that it really was a national um, application pool that came to us from research institutions all over the country, from you know, powerhouse research you know, with a lot of NIH funding to some with, with not as um, much NIH funding, but you know, robust uh, startups coming out of those schools. Um, so we were very, very pleased when we uh, received our applicant pool. And we started to have to think about, okay, so what does this mean for our applicants? Um, and what will this mean for the competitions? So if we can go to the next slide. Um, what we realized there was we thought we were only going to do, have one pitch event, but we realized that we really did have enough applicants to run a valuable pitch event um, in two different sectors, one in therapeutics and one in medical devices and diagnostics. And that's what you will see in the virtual platform that's going to go live um, on June 25th. And um, we knew, you know, from everything we've learned and, and OUP knew, we knew that we had to give um, credible mentors to those applicants and that we selected to go forward in the pitch competition to get one-on-one -on -one coaching. So uh, Casey and Shoba have been working together since January and they will continue to work together until June. And there's 11 other pairs that are working together. Um, and we really wanted credible judges. We wanted this to be a very uh, positive experience for the um, mentees and the mentors, uh, as well as anybody who was going to be here on that day. So we have judges coming from uh, GE Healthcare and j and J, Y Y Combinator, um, and, and other really fantastic places that look at this type of technology all the time and can give that credible feedback um, and meaningful feedback to help, uh, help the mentees sort of find their path. Um, 
So uh, again, on June 25th, we will have an online platform. We will put that up and be sending that out to everybody who's registered here today. But you can also go to equalize.wustl.edu to find more information on that. And so what does success look like? When we started thinking about this, um, does success look like everybody who is part of the competition is gonna walk out with a funded startup? No, that's, that's not the case. I don't think anybody um, has that expectation who applied, but it really is um, thinking about how can you expand somebody's network on a national level? So what's been interesting to us as we go through this, we can take the Casey Shoba pair and right now we're building out a pictorial of how Casey's network has grown beyond Shoba. Um, and we're doing that for each of the applicants. And so next year we'll be really excited to be able to showcase uh, that because I think it's gonna be really fun to look at. But building that network is such a critical piece. We're also looking at the satisfaction of the pitchers and the mentors, the judges, and even, even participants, um, understanding what people got out of it and, and did you learn and are you able to move your company forward? Um, and then the sense that this should occur again. So again, we want feedback from this um, and, you know, feel free to ask us questions, but I really do want to give most of the time to Casey and Shoba. Nicole, you're on mute. <laughs> uh, it's common, it's commonplace occurrence. Uh, so just a couple of follow-up questions on this, um, mm -hmm. Nicole. So, uh, one of them was from someone who said, uh, you know, the, the focus of Equalize right now seems to be on the life sciences. How about broadening that out? And this is something we did discuss early on. Uh, can you talk just to that for a, a minute? Yes. Um, so we, we opened it up pretty broad this year and we didn't know what we were going to get. And what happened was the applicants sort of coalesced um, in two main areas, though we did get applications in other areas. Um, this is a pilot year for us and we hope that it's successful and we think it will be. And as we're able to do this well, we hope that we can grow to other sectors for sure. Um, right. But we chose these sectors based on the breadth of what we received. Great, thanks. And, and someone else wrote in, you know, we didn't get a selected particularly this year. Um, how potentially can we get mentorship? And I definitely would, I know one of the things that we've talked about before is we really like people to reapply um, just because we did have so many more applicants, I think, than, than we expected. Uh, we do hope to grow this, so definitely re reapply, but there's also other things that we've talked about, about helping people uh, get mentorship, or at least uh, some advice. Yes, and so I want you to know that we are thinking about that, and we have thought about it, um, you know, in the context of the event being an in-person event in St. Louis, and we had planned out what a meaningful experience would look like, and, and I'm glad you asked that question, because I think a lot of times women will will um, feel rejected from this type of experience. Like, I didn't get selected. There's something wrong with me. There is absolutely nothing wrong. Like Kirsten said, we just had an overwhelming response that we didn't expect. Um, and we want to help anybody who applied. And um, we are planning some things, though they will probably be after uh, the equalized date right now, but we will be reaching out to um, the applicants that did not get selected as well to Great try to understand what we can do for you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, we do have one other question, but I'm gonna hold on to that question for our discussion with Shoba and Casey now, um, because it's really relevant, I think, to uh, some of what they're going through, but we can all chime in on it. Um, but I, before we get to that particular question, um, I wanna talk about the work, Shoba and Casey, that you've particularly been doing together and uh, maybe we can start off with Casey, you talking about um, why you applied uh, to the Equalize program. Sure. So I was informed of this program through a colleague at the University of Michigan, which is one of your major, major university partners. And she told me about this and I looked into it and I was immediately excited at the possibility to have mentorship uh, through this process because this is the this is the first time that I created a company do not you know I, I did not know exactly what I was doing was uh, trying my hardest working on pitches but to be able to hook to be hooked up with a mentor uh, was one of the most attractive things about this and then the actual pitch competition in, in June to have access and to build my network and to meet all of these people it it, it was uh it was the icing on the cake of this program so that's why i was attracted to it 
Terrific. Great to, he great to hear. Um, Shoba, as a mentor, uh, what interested you uh, in taking part in this particular program? Well, first of all, I'm very much aware that, uh, you know, there's a huge unmet need. And uh, also, to me, it's a privilege to be actually, you know, to serve as a mentor. But really, you know, if you look, look back at my career, you know, all these years helping fund early stage startup companies, I've actually witnessed um, with the hardships faced by entrepreneurs, both men and women alike. Uh, I've seen them, you know, bootstrapping for years without being able to raise any funding. Uh, I've seen them mortgage their homes. I've seen them uh, dip into their retirement funds, um, you know, all just to keep their companies afloat. So it really made me think how, you know, if only we could have gotten them uh, timely information, uh, you know, educate them, uh, give them resources for networking as well as, um, you know, for funding. Uh, if we could have done, maybe some of those hardships could have been alleviated, maybe avoided. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, secondly, I think uh, for investors, you know, we're always looking at ROI. And in this particular case, you know, it may not be return on our investment immediately, but definitely a return on impact for sure. Great, thank you, thank you both. I, I'd love to hear now about the experiences that you've had with talking with each other and kind of what are the biggest takeaways that you each have uh, on this experience? Because you two have talked with each other, I think. So you started the mentorship process, I think in January, is that, that right? And so you've talked to each other a few times. So what are some of the biggest takeaways for each of you? So I've been so fortunate to have been able to show my pitch deck to Shoba. And she goes through it slide by slide with me and provides amazing guidance um, in, in a way that I think is, is just helpful, like genuinely helpful and um, based on her experience. And so we go through these slides, I get advice. She connects me with, with people that can help um, provide some data for my slides. And a few weeks later, we talk again and we go through the next set. And we've been doing that I think four times now that she's given me her time um, and provided uh, such great input. Like my pitch deck looks so different than it did four months ago. Um, and it's hard. I think it's hard for a academic person to take out all the science <laughs> basically from a pitch deck um, that you've been working on your whole life and uh, turn it into basically a sales pitch. Um, but that's, that's, I think something that's really hard to do and the guidance that she's provided, um, the examples, the, and the, and the connections has been ex it, so valuable. Right. I would say, first of all, Casey, you're very coachable. So, you know, uh, <laughs> kudos to you on that one, because that makes my job a lot easier. Um, <laughs> for me, I think there were three key takeaways. I mean, just doing this made me realize that this sort of mentoring is so scalable across the country, you know, and uh, it's um, very inexpensive to implement and, and really low, low risk uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, having an upside to it. So what we're seeing happening through WashU and OUP and Equalize really could be easily scaled across the country. And I'd love to see that. So that's been a huge uh, takeaway for me, all of that. Great, thanks. Since Casey, since you brought up pitch decks, I'd like to ask a question, um, particularly to Shoba uh, about them. You know, you see pitch decks all the time. Um, could you talk about some of your experience around what makes a good pitch for you as a life science investor? Uh, you know, I could talk for the entire hour just on that, <laughs> but uh, really, I mean, the pitch deck, the way I look at it, you know, it's your resume for the company. That's what gets you the sort of the door entry into meeting with investors. So really, you have to put a lot of time and attention into that. And you have to get feedback from multiple people. There's going to be several iterations. You cannot get it right the first time around. Also, you know, pitch deck is sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and, you know, there are many, many pieces to it. And it really, you get the good, a really good picture only when all of those pieces come together. And when I talk about the little pieces, you know, it's pretty much, um, I would say, a formula, a checklist in terms of the content of a pitch deck. But it's how you bring it all together. 
you know, whether it's your, 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 what is the problem you're solving? You know, what's the solution? How is differentiated from every other solution out there? What's your market, the competitive landscape, your team, uh, you know, the risks, the challenges, your financials, what's the ask? These are pretty standard across any deck, but it's how you bring it all together. And the most important thing is your unique story. Have, you know, in addition to the technical, the science piece of it, in addition to the business aspects of it, what is it unique, your unique story that you bring together? So all of that, uh, actually, you know, we take into account, you know, and at the end of the day, we are investing in companies, but really, we're also investing in people, people that we think we can work with long term. Uh, people that we trust, respect, we know who will be able to deliver. Because when you make investment in a seed company, we're hoping that we will be able to stay with that company all the way to the exit. So it's not a one-time single transaction, right? You're talking about a seed stage to series A, B, and beyond, or whatever that might be. So we are thinking long-term. We want the entrepreneurs to think long-term as well. And so put in the time and effort needed to get it right. Great, thanks. We have, we have a really good follow-up question to this, which is pertinent to our conversation today. So I love this lead-in that someone provided. Um, so are there particular areas or items in a pitch deck from women that are difficult to sell to investors who are predominantly men? Where, you know, th this is an issue that comes up quite a bit and I think is sometimes difficult for people to answer. I see Nicole nodding because she we've talked about this before. Um, but are there particular things, and we, we've already, I, I know that some of us, and, and perhaps this is a discussion we can have, is, is, um, is the preconceptions that sometimes come with pitching uh, as, as a woman um, to an audience that, that may be predominantly men, et cetera. Um, but what, are, there, are there particular areas or items that, that, that perhaps women need to focus on on the pitch deck more? And Nicole, I know that you've, you've worked on this some too, so feel free and Stephanie to jump in. Um, so it, it's interesting, and um, I can comment from a space of, there's actually research in this area um, that a, a woman who's now, I believe she's at the London College of Business, her name is Donna Cans, but she's actually spelled Dana, so if you're looking it up, it's D-A-N-A, -A, uh, K-A-N-Z-E, um, and she has looked at models of what women face in the boardroom, so it's not necessarily what's in their pitch deck, rather how do they um, get the questions they want to get in the boardroom when they're pitching. Um, and there's a whole series that she has on how to get promotion questions, which men tend to get um, over women. But if you can change the language you're using, um, you can have more success in getting these promotion questions. And so she's a researcher and has done a lot of work in this area. So I would encourage um, people to check out her work. It's very interesting. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, another person along the same lines is asking, are there narrative techniques that, that work better for female founders? Um, and she's thinking particularly back to an article that she read um, about investors asking more risk mitigating questions versus reward potential questions to, to female versus uh, male founders. I think you, you kind of were addressing that, Nicole, um, in, in your response there. But um, you know, should, should there be a different narrative technique when you're a, a female? pitcher rather than a male pitcher. Um, I mean, in general, we're trying to equalize, right? <laughs> um, but that's something to, to think about and consider. Yeah, uh, while people are thinking about that question, I think it's, um, we've given a lot of thought to this, Kirsten, because at some level, it shouldn't be that way. It should not be that a woman has to change her words and her language. Um, and so you have to sort of, I think, dip on both sides right now in the, in the environment that we're in. So if you want to be successful, it behooves you to think about how you communicate there. At the same time, when, when we host um, investors at WashU, uh, and we host them when we have our gap fund, for example, we actually give the same, um, we give the same information to the investors to say, hey, do you know that when you're sitting listening to a pitch, you may be hearing it differently and you need to think about how you're hearing that. So I think in the environment right now, we do unfortunately have to think about both sides of this and women may have to think differently, but if we can all work together to get to a place where language is neutral, that is the best place to be. Right. 
that would be optimal. <laughs> so, so moving on from just pitching, um, uh, Casey, I'm going to address this to you first. I'm going to make it a broader question actually afterwards um, that, that's actually a, a aligned with the question that came in about, around this area is, what do you find, Casey, have been some specific challenges for you as an entrepreneurial female faculty member? Um, and do you have an, any ideas on possibly some changes that are needed and potentially what those, those are? Sure, yeah, I think um, one, one change, uh, one thing that I've always been hesitant about is the extra um, after hours work that was involved with being an entrepreneur, you know, with when you have kids at home, um, a lot of women feel like they want to go home after work, make dinner, see their kids, help them with their homework. And so many of these entrepreneurial events are in the evenings and five to seven, or, you know, and, um, and I think when the, my kids were much smaller, I was much, I was very hesitant to add on additional additional things like that. Um, and at a professional level, trying to get tenure, being an entrepreneur does not go very far with a tenure committee. That is for sure. So, you know, I waited uh, a little while till the kids were older until I had tenure. And then I, I jumped into it. You know, I took an NSF i program um, up in Michigan and learned about it. And, uh, still still was um, hesitant to jump into it until you know the research in our lab showed that that we'd come up with a very exciting medical device so uh, at that time I just tried to find as much information out uh, on my own as I could and tried to attend start attending these events um, a sad story uh, in January I was at a I was at a a, a pitch event. One of my friends was pitching, so I went for support, and I was writing down all the all the questions that were being asked, so I could prepare myself for my pitching. And I had written down um, what is the IP, uh, uh, you know, what is the IP situation, something like that. And a random man next to me leans over and he says, "IP means intellectual property." I said, what, <laughs> you know, why do you think I'm here? You know, it was, it was, it's still, so it's, you know, it, it's still, there's always going to be a problem that, um, you, you know, they've, of making yourself a believable CEO as a female in this, in what is so many men, you know? So I think there's, there's uh, some things that can be done to, to help, uh, females at, at each stage in their career at the university level of trying to balance all of this. Right. Yeah, and so one of the questions that uh, came in uh, was about balance and um, inequality, particularly in the share of home and family activities. Uh, um, and, and that that's, uh, you, you were talking about, you know, the concentration on tenure and, and getting to that point that you had needed to get that first before um, perhaps moving on to the entrepreneurial uh, uh, side of things. Um, and I'd love for anyone to, to, um, to chime in on this, but are there ways that we should be considering to address these inequality in the share of home and family activities? Um, are there ideas, are there things that you've seen out there that perhaps helps with this? Um, uh, and I'm, so I'm curious what, what your experiences have been. Um, I think, you know, it, maybe it's, it's a re-educating uh, to make it really, uh, you know, a partnership at home, um, you know, where the duties are shared. Uh, from my personal experience, I can tell you that, uh, you know, I have worked jobs uh, where I lived in a different state and I would see my family only on the weekends. So my husband agreed to, you know, manage the kids, take them to football and harp and, and uh, you know, cook dinner as well as work. So uh, we've done that for each other, but it requires a, a different level of thinking from both sides to have that partnership to share so that both of you can actually grow in your careers and one doesn't have to give up and compromise for the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think common advice that I always give junior faculty to is um, to hire a cleaning service. Um, you, you know, I've never met anybody that regrets having a cleaning service and taking that off of your plate. And it's just less stressful. It's, it, it's something that I think is 
universally accepted to, to just try to remove some, some of those chores off of both of your plates. And right. Is a but it's interesting too because I feel this is a conversation um, that we as women often have with each other. But it's not a broader conversation about who's, you know, doing thinking about that. Okay, okay, we should do a cleaning service because that'll help. The <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> Nicole, you were going to say something. Um, I, I was going to echo what Casey said years ago. I was at um, the Biomedical Engineering Society meeting, and um, there was a serial entrepreneur who was female from Colombia, and she was out there speaking to young faculty, postdocs, and. She said, the best advice that I can give you is your, your savings doesn't matter as much as getting through this and doing what you need to do. So hire a housekeeper, um, hire somebody who can help you with the kids, do the homework, whatever it is, you need to make it through to tenure and it will help you with thinking about entrepreneurship too. So um, it's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, we have a number of other questions. I'm going to try to keep getting to these. Uh, so what are some good resources for founders to learn business skills, including fundraising and term sheet negotiation? And I'd love for all of you to chime on this on just different places that you have found um, to help get these business skills. Um, Casey, you already mentioned the i -Corps program uh, as far as um, you know, kind of learning more about what your business is and what your focus is, et cetera. But um, I'd love for each of you to maybe give a resource and we can also uh, point to people to some resources afterwards too. I'm happy to add. I mean, I think the first stop, uh, Casey, you wanna go ahead first. Oh. Is there anything else you wanna say? Oh, no, go ahead, Shiva. Now, I was just going to say, I mean, your first stop really should be your tech transfer offices if you're an academic entrepreneur, because a lot of times, you know, they have expertise in that and they often bring people from industry to join the tech transfer office. So you might be able to, I mean, that's not a bad place to get started. You can get a lot of information there on some of those business skills. They can also connect you to uh, the entrepreneurs in the area that you can use as consultants or advisors. So um, definitely start in your immediate circle of contacts to get that. Um, states have a various, uh, depending on the state that you live in, you know, you can access resources. Um, uh, you know, uh, most of them will have like a biotech center or, uh, um, you know, some sort of uh, 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 bio, uh, which is a trade organization, and they all have access to the, that information. So it's a matter of finding in your state, which is the organization that deals with this. You know, a lot of states have programs where they give loans, SBA loans, uh, to uh, entrepreneurs. And so they have that sort of information. And so, um, and of course, if you go on the web, there's no, I mean, there's plenty of it. So uh, start with your immediate circle and then uh, reach out to contacts from that network. Yeah, I, I agree, Shoba. Um, and, and the tech transfer network is, you know, usually connected um, very deeply in its local community, um, but also has, you know, national network points. Um, one thing that's interesting, though, was I was recently um, reviewing grants, uh, and, and there was a number of faculty that were with me doing the science side, and I was looking at the, the innovation side of these grants, and um, one of the women there had already talked to her uh, tech transfer office, and um, they had sort of pointed her in a direction to maybe do i -Corp, but I, it, I could tell from the conversation that it was very overwhelming. Um, just to think about it. And I think, you know, she just needed to really have a one on one with somebody. And so it was nice that I could connect with her, you know, haphazardly. We didn't know that we would be sitting next to each other. Um, and I think by the end of that, just being able to talk about what was her worries and fears um, about moving forward and what was stressing her out about, you know, thinking about i -Corps at that moment, even though she had the support of the tech transfer office, she was still overwhelmed. So finding an individual that you can just have that relationship with. Um, and, you know, there's now five people on this webinar that you could reach out to and just say, I'm overwhelmed. And I need you to like do baby steps with me through that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, I am happy to do that for anybody. But I think you, you don't need to feel overwhelmed. I think like Casey said, just these little steps and sort of piecing together things, it's very normal. Um, and, and there's lots of 
people who are willing to help with that. And there's nothing wrong with raising your hand and saying, I feel overwhelmed and I, somebody told me and I still don't know where to start. So I just wanna add quickly the entrepreneurs and residents at uh, my university, University of Pittsburgh are very helpful. I think I've met with every single one. <laughs> and um, so they'll meet with you for free and they'll just you know go through you know, look through your business plan or look through your pitch deck and just give you advice. Um, and, and it's more of a, a one shot deal kind of thing. I think that, you know, they work, they seem to work 15% of their effort is at the University of Pittsburgh. So they're still CEOs of their own companies, but the entrepreneurs and residents, the EIRs, I think are a good, good place to um, get some information as well. And one of the people who wrote in uh, in, uh, in the Q&A box also uh, recommended the Small Business Development Center that they have uh, for workshops and classes. And there, there are definitely, a, there are a ton of online resources. Uh, we also have a number of um, different types of um, educational programs on venture capital and fundraising as well at OUP. So yeah, just, it, it's a lot of it's just reaching out and, and asking, as you said, Nicole, for that help. and and. Uh, uh, saying, here's what I need to understand. Um, and, and people, a lot, most people love to give advice. <laughs> so. right. And I just sent, I just sent a resource that I like out to all through the chat, I think. Okay, great. Great. Thanks. Um, and, and actually, so, so Casey, you just mentioned the, the EIRs uh, at your institution and many, many tech transfer offices have these MIR, EIR programs. But um, one of the things this person noted was that the mass majority of these mentors tend to be men. Do you know what impact that this can have potentially for women entrepreneurs? Um, when uh, you know, they're uh, uh, perhaps not always seeing someone, well, is this person like me and have they had the same experiences? So um, Nicole, you know, we obviously had a, a broad range of people as far as our, our mentors through this program. Um, but I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I, I mean, Casey, feel free because you're you're the boots on the ground. But I I I think it can be daunting. Um, and I would say to try to to find somebody that you feel comfortable with, and that may be a man, it may be a woman. Um, but there are many men who are supportive of this, and they are mentors and judges in Equalize. Um, and in also in the Science to Startups program uh, that OUP has in many other places. So um, some men will say, I'm doing this because I have two daughters and I don't, you know, I want them to be successful. So they are, they are just as much our allies as, as our women uh, counterparts are, but you should definitely look to somebody you feel comfortable with and um, don't think of it as a single mentor. So if somebody says no, or you don't, connect with that person, just move on. That's totally fine. Um, use your network to find somebody who can help you um, better. So I wanted to, um, that, that's really helpful, Nicole. I, I wanted to uh, move on to something that you, you had talked about, Casey, about um, the time, having the time for entrepreneurship, <laughs> um, considering everything you're also doing at an academic institution. We had a number of uh, questions, and questions and thoughts on this from, from the group. I'm going to kind of frame one of them that will hopefully capture a few different things, but um, there's a prevailing uh, belief that active faculty are not the best startup founders because they can't commit as much time and energy that is required to run a company because um, they have their academic programs that they're, they're dealing with. Um, is there any data on trainee participation, so grad students, postdocs, et cetera, that are interested in academic entrepreneurship and how that splits across gender lines? You guys know about that? I think it's a really good question and I don't know whether it's been answered before. I, I don't have data on the grad students, but I do know that my grad student is uh, participating in my startup company with me. And um, what we had to do was go through our conflict of interest office for a series of interviews and um, approvals at many different levels. And we have, um, so we know that there's a, a very, thick line between his graduate work and the company and that kind of thing. So um, the University of Pittsburgh does allow me one day a week to devote to the company, which is great. 
you know, that doesn't happen, but you know, it's great. Like in theory, if, if Fridays are my Axomax day, you know, I don't schedule any meetings that day. I don't teach that day, but you know, things come up all the time. I'm still working on, on things for work, but it's really nice to have dedicated time that the university um, agreed to and your, your chair agreed to that, that you could do this. So um, I just personally, you know, I, I just know when I was tenure track going up for tenure, my focus was getting grants and writing good papers and, and mentoring PhD students. So um, it's just, I just felt after I had tenure, then I had um, a little breathing room that I could fill with the entrepreneur space. That doesn't mean that you can't do it at the same time, your tenure track as well. You know, absolutely. I just know from serving on our tenure committee, tenure and promotion committee for three years, um, that there, there's, there's not a box that we check off for entrepreneurship, right? We check off the, the teaching their evaluations, the number of grants, you know, number of papers, their service. So it, it just seemed to me um, at my institution that, that that was the best path for me. Yeah. I well, haven't I seen that. data, Kirsten, on um, trainees. Uh, and I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of, you know, in the back of my head, I'm curious if, if we could collaborate with OUP because I bet universities would be able to feed information in to sort of get some data around that. But um, I don't think there is data out there. I suspect there is a gender gap there as well, because, you know, oftentimes when you're doing your postdoc, these are the times when you're thinking about starting a family or thinking about how do I get a, a, a you know, faculty position and all of the things that Casey talked about going along with that. Um, so I suspect there is probably a gender gap, but I don't know that there's data. Well, it's definitely something uh, if someone's listening that they want to address, um, it certainly could be looked at. Um, I'm going to actually uh, switch gears a little bit just because I think this is obviously um, a prominent topic right now, and that is about COVID-19. Um, the question that came in was, how has venture investing changed during the COVID-19 era, and how should we as founders adjust our pitches for that? And Stephanie and Shobel, I'll, I'll direct this one to you. I know this isn't the main focus, obviously, of our conversation today, but it is something that's on everyone's minds. I would say for us, uh, at least at Santajani, uh, we are going about business as usual. We are, you know, um, working on um, pitches. We're looking at, uh, you know, term sheets. We've uh, just made uh, some uh, uh, investments. So um, it hasn't changed much for us. And uh, in fact, I think if anything, uh, we've become more busy because now people actually have time to, you know, catch up on all that backlog of companies that had uh, reached out to, to us earlier. So uh, from our perspective, uh, it hasn't changed. And it looks like there is plenty of money and, and investors are investing um, or at least making decisions at the stages that we are. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I, I would say you know, most of that, um, I think, is very similar for OUP as well. The one thing that we have questioned for new deals coming in where we haven't met the team is sort of how do we manage you know, getting to know the team over formats like Zoom. And so there's a little bit of a learning curve and an and adjustment there. Um, but I think for the most part, we, we like to think that it's, it's business as usual. Um, but I would say it's important for companies to emphasize when they are pitching so how have you been affected by this slowdown and what does this mean for your budget and what you're going to be able to accomplish in a certain time frame? And to be upfront about those things, because we are, we're not talking to any company right now where we expect them to say, oh, everything's totally normal for us. So, you know, I, I would say make sure you're communicating, you know, the difficulties you're facing and, and how you're managing them. Yeah, and clearly we are aware of the delays, you know, several yeah. clinical trials are on hold right now. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of questions left from the audience and we haven't gotten to all of our questions left. I'm, I'm wondering, does the panel have another 15 minutes or so that they can stay on um, for this, that we can answer some more of these questions? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you so much. Um, I know that some people may need to, to get off the, uh, the webinar right now just because um, it, it is coming on the hour. You may have other things that you already had obligated. We're going to put up a, um, a survey in our chat box. If people can answer that, we'd really appreciate it because um, 
it is something we, we use these survey responses. It's a very, very short survey. Um, we use these surveys to figure out what we're going to be uh, doing webinars and on in the future. But I'm going to keep going through these questions. We have a lot of these questions um, coming in from everyone about uh, different things that they could do. Uh, one of these questions go back um, to a comment, I think a comment that you had made, Casey, about um, uh, whether there's any data on women uh, on tenure track, whether they do less entrepreneurial activity than their male counterparts, um, or is this something that's common among all um, uh, tenure tra track uh, um, um, faculty uh, for um, on entrepreneur entrepreneurship? Yeah, I, I don't have any data um, on that. I did reach out to our Office of Technology Management to try to get some um, statistics um, on the female uh, um, academics who have created startups at the university, but they weren't able to provide that. Um, they were able to give me a handful of names of females who have started a company. So um, I'm guessing it's going to be around the number that Stephanie showed earlier, of 13% perhaps. So, no, I don't, I don't have the, the numbers on that, just my experience, you know, on the tenure and promotion committee of, of what I've seen come through um, at the University of Pittsburgh. Kirsten, this is a really interesting question um, that has always been in the back of my mind, and we have tried to look at it at WashU um, just in a snapshot, right? So, if you take, you know, a tenure period that I can look at data from my office, um, I can... I can see a difference, but the problem is that men and women enter universities at different times, right? So they might enter as an associate professor with tenure already, or they may came up, come in as a professor, and I don't understand what their previous um, entrepreneurial activity has been um, or how robust that has been. I know when they engage me, what, you know, I, I can ask them, have you had entrepreneurial experience before? And, and we can get at that, but I don't know the list of disclosures and I don't know when they first started disclosing. Um, so, you know, again, I think this is something that if we really wanted to look at data, this is sort of a national effort that we have to be able to track someone's career, um, you know, as a researcher. But, you know, anecdotally at WashU, I do think there's a difference. Um, and I do think that because of the barriers that women face, by the time they get to be a full professor, the hurdle is higher to even thinking about this because maybe they haven't really thought about commercialization very much prior to that. Yeah. But I'd like to elaborate on a study. Yeah, right. <laughs> In all that spare time we have right now. Right. <laughs> I, I really love this this um, uh, question because it's something I know that I've talked with a number of you about, about before, and, and, and it is, should women be the champions of these initiatives, or should women try to get men, especially those leading um, tech transfer offices or departments, et cetera, at the, the universities, to lead at least a part of these efforts? And are there ideas of how to inspire men to do this? And, um, and we've We've, we've, been, we've done this before, so this is, a, this is a nice to be able to talk about this a little bit about some of the efforts we've done on this. Um, and this, the, the comment this person had is, I've noticed it starts to feel like a tax for women to have to always be the lead on trying to lead or drive initiatives in this area. And I really, so I really appreciate the person who wrote this in, um, and I'd love to get your thoughts, thoughts on this from each of you. See, for me, it's, it's really about, you know, building a bridge to success, not just a peer. So it, it's, uh, we need everyone to be involved and in, in engaged in this. Uh, right from the state level to the communities, to the universities, everybody across the board needs to be involved in it. Uh, you know, some states have done a good job. You know, I, um, Massachusetts has the Next Initiative, uh, which is basically a program focused just for women entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a year long coaching with some non-dilutive funding to get them going. Um, Maryland has done it, I think, through TEDCO. It's called Task Force for Women Entrepreneurs. So, uh, and this is not just women's initiatives. These are, you know, men and women coming together to run these initiatives. So this is coming at the state level. Uh, universities can do a whole lot of things. And again, it, it doesn't have to be a women's issue. Everybody can do this because it's a win-win for all. And I would love to see something like um, Seek a Mentor, Be a Mentor kind of campaigns all across the country at all the universities. I'd love to be able to see, um, you know, founder boot camps. 
taking place. I'd love to see uh, sort of successful faculty, those who've been successful to starting to mentor the ones who are thinking of starting. Um, I mean, there are so many ways, you know, regular reviews of faculty developing uh, products, so you kind of proactively engaging them, getting them on board rather than reactively doing it. Um, a lot of states that I go to, they tell me that there is no local executive management talent. But look at us today, we're over 100 people uh, from all over the country. So we can't, there's no excuses, right? Online resources, connecting people, all this can be done. So it's not just about women initiatives, everybody gets to uh, win in this and everybody needs to do this at all levels. That's my preaching. <laughs> Other thoughts from any of the other uh, panelists? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with Shoba. It, it, it behooves everybody um, to make this work um, and not just for women, but all underrepresented minorities um, and, and populations. Um, there's lots of information that suggests that it would increase our GDP. That's good for everybody. Um, but I, I, I do think that sometimes these initiatives tend to be driven by the person who is, you know, mo most interested. I don't know if that's the right way to think about it. But um, once you sort of in introduce the initiative and you can kind of get people behind you, it doesn't have to be you alone. So, um, you know, our, our Women Innovators program at WashU is not me alone as female. We do have lots of people who know that this is an important thing, and that's why our university is supporting a national effort. Yeah, no, I, I agree with both Shoba and Nicole. Those are great answers. Um, I had found in Pittsburgh a, a fund, a group of women who were uh, successful at their startups and exited and then they pulled their money together and they're called the next act fund and they only fund female CEOs and so I've gone to a few of their networking events and they're so incredibly supportive and helpful that that's a resource that I found that I think there's several angel investor groups out there that are for women only or women only that really can provide a lot of mentoring and resources that um, that, that may not be you know, readily available at, at their own universities. So um, we've had a number of questions and I'm kind of gonna put, try to put these together about the Equalize pitch event, which obviously has changed dramatically from what we had uh, uh, originally envisioned um, for June 25th, Nicole. Um, and so people are wondering about uh, how the connections with investors potentially will be made. Also, um, will many female investors um, be a part of, of the pitch day itself? Yes, so um, we are, we know all of the, and we will know all of the individuals who are um, coming on board for this. A lot of us are using our networks again to personally invite people and ask people to participate and we're getting um, incredible receptivity over that. I know OUP um, also has their networks that are being, uh, you know, c uh, tapped to, to talk about this as well. Um, and, and so, yes, I think it, it is a little bit different. We had hoped that investors would be here in person. Um, and so, uh, you know, a virtual platform is slightly different. And so making sure that we have names and people who are willing to follow up will be an important piece of this. And, and Kirsten, feel free to comment, or Stephanie as well. Yeah, I mean, overall, the reception um, from the investor community in general has been terrific. Um, we are obviously not just reaching out to an investor community that is fully female. We have, we have gone wide, <laughs> gone broad. Um, and and that's, that's the point, is we want everyone to potentially um, uh, have a stake in this. And, and, and be committed to, to make, helping make these changes. Um, so, and we, I have to say, one of the things that was really wonderful when we reached out to our mentors is um, pretty much everyone was just like, yes, yes, I wanna be a part of this. And, and I think our mentors are actually split gender-wise, half 50-50. Um, so it's really, it was really uh, just, it was very encouraging. <laughs> Um, and gratifying to see. And um, I, I, I just, I, we'll, we're, we're gonna hope everything runs smoothly on in, in June 25th. I think it will. 
Um, we're figuring out the logistics on that, uh, but then also how to continue to make those connections between the pitchers um, and investors, but also those who, um, who aren't pitching but are in, very interested in, obviously, uh, their, their entrepreneurial um, endeavors. So. Um, we have a number of other questions. I'm actually going to start wrapping this up now um, because what I think what we may do is because there are still so many potential open questions is I'm going to have send these to each of you to, to follow up on any ones any of the ones that are left here. We also got a what I love about this <laughs> is that we got so many terrific recommendations from people um, answering also some of the questions on some different programs that are happening, some ideas that people can be using. And so what I think we'll do is we'll summarize some of the suggestions that came in and send those out to um, all of our attendees today as well. Um, so in the meantime, um, uh, as I mentioned, um, there should be this, this uh, chat box coming up that should uh, have a survey in it. We'll also send the survey to all of you um, to, uh, to, to fill out afterwards. Um, we really appreciate your doing this, but I really like to thank all of you, Stephanie, Shoba, Casey, Nicole, for participating today, sharing your experience, your knowledge um, on this. It was really, I think, a very valuable webinar. I, get, I think it got a lot of people uh, some ideas of things that they'd like to do in the future as well. So thank you so much for um, being a part of this today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, and thank you to our audience for attending, for participating, being such active participants on this. Um, and we hope to see you on another webinar soon. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe, uh, stay healthy and stay sane. Bye-bye.